Yeah, so let's see. So um, I'm really curious how this event is going to turn out. Um, it's a bit of an unusual experience to speak in front of so many Japanese people in, in English. But uh, so today I wanted to talk about the automation in the software development context. But to start off, um, I wanted to start with something that hopefully many of you are already familiar with. So this is the famous Moore's law charted in your graph. So as you can see in the top green line, the number of transistors in the computer, which is kind of roughly equivalent to the amount of computation that you have in one chip, is sort of growing exponentially. But if you also notice the other three lines at the bottom, what they are telling is that the single thread performance, that is the, the combined clock speed and then the, uh, what's like, available inside the single, I mean the instruction per clock, it's, it's sort of the tattooing. And then I think this is not something that's news to probably many of you. That is, what this means is that the, there are many cores in the single chip that's the driving the performance, not the single thread performance like it used to be, in, say, 20 years ago. So today you can get, so let's say, like a processor that has 16 cores in a single chip. That's the AMD Optron processor. Or if you go look at the Spark, because the Spark processor traditionally has been very weak in the single thread performance, the way they fix this is by cramming a whole lot more threads inside a single chip. So they got this, the capability of executing 64 concurrent hardware threads inside a single chip. And if you buy any server, they come in like a two or four per system. So that's a lot of the, uh, the concurrent execution capability that we are talking about. And after all, if you look at the processor that you got in your cell phone, nowadays even those things come with multiple cores. And again, I think this is sort of been said many times before, but the, um, the, the direction of how we get the additional computing power now comes from a higher degree of concurrency and parallelism as opposed to the traditional way of just getting faster things that runs on your existing programs. Now, while people are, some people are busy putting lots of cores inside a single hardware chip, the other kind of people are busy putting lots of lots of computers in this single building. And it used to be that the only engineers in companies like Google or Amazon who is actually capable of, I mean, they has the ability to tap into this much computing power. But thanks to the EC2 or the Rackspace or the Windows Azure or all these cloud services, now everyone is actually capable of accessing this, this sort of this performance. And then the only thing that's limiting you is the amount of dollar figure you could pay to these servers. So this is no longer just a Google problem that every one of us has to actually think of the ways to take advantage of all these additional computers that's available. Now the slight, I mean somewhat related but still slightly different topic is the advancement in the virtualization technologies. I mean this is a big enough industry that could enable a billion dollar company that is a VMware. Um, and so because, thanks to these people, not only the physical number of computers are proliferating, but it's also true that the inside each computer that you get, you, now you get multiple logical computers. That from the perspective of the, the programmers that's dealing with it, it's, it's no different from having multiple computers. It used to be that, um, I guess this is my favorite server, uh, I used because I used to work for some microsystems, that you can get this kind of sample year 15,000, this, like, this one piece goes for like a million dollar piece, they, they actually have like a 64 uh, concurrent execution capability. I think the four threads each on one chip and then 16 sockets, I believe it's the configuration. But despite the fact that it's capable of executing 64 things at the same time, this was still a single system Unix image. So you can run processes on this box and then they, they could take care of, I mean, they, the, uh, the hardware takes care of making sure that your stuff you know, runs on the available cores, and then all the memories are visible to all the CPUs and so on and so forth. So this is substantially easier to program than, let's say, as opposed to dealing with 64 separate computers that's connected through the Ethernet or something like that. Um, the other important things that the cloud brought us, and I'm certainly not the first one to point this out, is the fact that they have this utility pricing model, meaning you know, to a certain extent, the time and the, the degree of concurrency is exchangeable, right? Let's say if you got some workload that takes the three, you know, three units of work, and provided that they could be parallelized, 
you could just execute three of them in parallel and then get the same result back in one third of the time. Now, this has been true, certainly. I mean, the, this is actually not new in the sense that the, if you think about the unit of time in, in terms of months or years, you did have this capability before. But what the cloud brought us is that because now the, the amount of the charge that's happening is based on the hours or sometimes even minutes. Now, now the, when we talk about the workload that can be parallelized, we're now looking at the workload that's, let's say, worth three hours worth of number crunching, which is not a lot. Right? So at this scale, this sort of creates the higher economic incentive for us to go for the high degree of concurrency. Because if you can get, let's say, if you can do some, I don't know, the um, Apache log file analysis or whatever, that is something like that, and then if you can get the result back in one third of the time, then you'd be fool not to do so. Right? So this is creating all kinds of interesting environment in which people are trying to enable this without making us do too much work. So I guess what I'm trying to get here is that the, you know, the, the amount of computing that's at our disposal is sort of getting increasing, I mean, getting, I mean growing still quite rapidly. And it's also at the same time getting cheaper and cheaper. But at the same time, if you look at the price of the, us, the warm human beings, and the cost that we incur to the, the business, that's actually not changing all that much. In fact, we kind of hope that that is going up, right? We all want to get paid more. But the simple laws of economics would state that if you got one thing, right? So for us to produce the software, it takes the, the certain amount of combination between both factors. One is the, the amount of computing that we use, plus the, plus the, as, the uh, as the warm brains. Now, if one is getting cheaper and then the other is not, the sort of the, it dictates that the economic rationality requires that we spend more on computing. We try to replace the human beings with more computers because that's cheaper. And then there's a relentless pressure in that space uh, that forces us. And so I think this is the sort of the characterizing underlying trend that I see in many of the things that's happening in the software development landscape. So now, if we talk about using all these additional computers, Right? Because that's, that's sort of like economic necessity here. But the challenge is that we, the human beings, are somewhat constrained in the sense that we could really only use a few computers at any given time. So in a movie like this, you often see the, the, the guy that's the computer technician is actually using multiple computers. But even at that, like we are talking about, maybe a dozen or half a dozen. And I think we all know that you know, this actually only happens in a movie. And if you actually try to do this in person, you'd be at most using two, right? You might have enough displays, but these are just like showing stuff. You're not actually using those. And so this is clearly not enough to be able to take advantage of all these additional computers that you have to do. I mean, you have to utilize. And so what that means is that the, all these additional computing power needs to be almost by definition used as a servers in place, that sits in places that you don't see, right? And then for you to be able to take advantage of it, I think it's sort of becoming more and more like this uh, sheep shepherd, right? I mean, the sheep herder. At least. So this is, this is as the software developers in the 21st century, hopefully you know, a little better outfit and whatnot. But you know, each one of us has to use tens or even hundreds of computers. And so that's the sheep. And then the only way to make this possible is by using the help, that is the shepherds. Now, in your context, when I think about you know, how we sort of can utilize that many computers effectively, then I think really the, the thing, the, for us, the shepherd dogs are the automation. It's the, it's the thing that, that bridges us to all these number of computers. That is the automation that enables that. And then without it, I think it's, it's quite impossible. So, well, so far I argued this from the direction of economic inevitability, which is not quite like a rosy picture for us, right? It's sort of we feel like we are getting pushed into this direction. But I think it's also true that if you think about what's going on here, this is kind of also what we want as ourselves. So the, especially in the context of system integration business, I mean, it's been pointed out a number of times that um, the, the way those industry work is quite labor intensive. So you put a lot of, well, you know, semi-experienced programmers, I apologize, I mean, allow me for, pardon my friends, so to speak. But I mean, we put a lot of these, these half newbies 
into this project and then hopefully you know, try to get something done, which is quite labor intensive. And that's not how we could compete with, let's say, like emerging countries like India or China, if are, they, the engineers are a lot cheaper. So we really do want to shift by ourselves to be able to sort of go into these computer intensive directions. So like each of us with almost like, a, let's say, a superhuman that's um, the harnessed by the exoskeleton, I guess, if you go back to the matrix and all the, so that we could deliver a lot more than our physical body is capable of. So we really do want to get to this direction, not only, and it is, it, well, it is, the, it is the convenient fact that this is also something that's forced upon us. Now, another related but slightly different topic here is, but I think this is equally important, is the fact that a lot more things are becoming programmable or slash automatable. Right, so the virtual, I talked about the virtual machine, the hypervisors a little bit in the earlier slides. Now, one of the things that the virtual machine technology has made possible is to use a program to control computers, like starting the, I mean, power, from simple things like powering on and powering off, or they move the machines to one location to another, configuring the topology of the network into the shapes that you want, and so on. And these things um, enable sort of new, brand new, uh, and these things enable the brand new things that pre previously just was not possible. Right? So th things like, let's say, cloning the virtual machines from a pristine environment, and then use that for test executions, and at the end of it, you could throw them away and then start from scratch for the next execution. Or the fact that the um, temporarily double the number of servers during the deployment of the new version so that you could sort of gradually shift the workload into newer version while retaining this ability to instantly flip back to the previous versions. These are the kind of things that the only this additional programmability was I mean, made possible for. Um, in a separate space, but in a similar space, there is the uh, tools like Chef and Puppet are quite, I mean, quite becoming popular. And if you, think of, if you look at these scripts that's used to configure the middlewares and tools in multiple computers, it's really it really feels like a programming language. Right? So in a way, you're, you're programming the installation and configuration of the, all these middleware softwares. So in a way, it is a kind of the programmability that previously you weren't able to do this. Those things were only possible manually, but now these things are becoming more and more automatable, more and more programmable. And this notion of making things more programmable, it's suddenly not foreign in the, in the tools that we use as a develop, software developers. Right? The, the notion, I guess we often call it non-interactive mode or the batch mode. But uh, for example, the, one, one mode of this is the machine readable output from the tools. If you look at the, um, my favorite example is the version control system. If you look at the previous generation of version control system, like let's say CVS, hopefully no one is using that in this century anymore. But if you, use, if you look at these tools, the output that they produce is actually not machine readable. The designer have never thought about making that output into machine readable form. So I know for this fact, I, I know this for the fact because I wrote this tool that parses the log output from CVS, but it's actually ambiguous that you can't sometimes differentiate what's in the commit messages bus or the delimiter that shows up. And that's the norm, because back then the version control system was thought to be something human would use, not machines. But if you look at the current generation of the version control system, let's say Mercurial or Git or that kind of things, they even have this option to let the caller specify the template, which controls how the output gets formatted. So clearly this notion of making the output machine readable was a very important design goal for, all, for these developers. Another good example might be the test frameworks. So again, um, if you look at the previous generation of test tools, like let's say HP Quality Center, um, the, I hope there's no one from HP here, but um, so these tools are actually not capable of producing machine readable outputs. That they, they can only be run from this Windows GUI and the result would show up in the same GUI. So it's great for the humans to look at that, but it's not so great if you're thinking about sort of having machines read that output. But in contrast, if you look at the modern test frameworks, I mean, any, anything is fine, I mean, the, the, you, well, you name it. And these things almost always support some form of machine readable output. In fact, there is a certain effort to standardize the format that they use to produce the same thing because there are so many tools who benefit from being able to 
have a single single parser on all the performance. Or the on Windows, which is traditionally very, I guess the Windows guys just didn't grok this notion that the, these things is supposed to be automatable. Even there, um, the tools like the MS build, which is designed for the machine readable output and then the machine, I mean the headless automation, it, it's there and gaining a lot of tractions. So this is creating a positive cycle so that it, as developers recognize the value of automations, we are sort of demanding the vendors be providing those the same capability for their tools, and then that's forcing vendors to react. And then so that's creating a quite nice cycles in your environment. Another place you can see this effort might be this browser automation, right? So the browser is like the, the extreme opposite of something programmable. It's meant to be used by humans, to be read and comprehend, comprehended by humans. But again, I mean, there's, if you look at all these people using Selenium and WebDriver and so on, there's a lot of interest, the, the quite understandable interest in being able to automate the browsers. And so the vendors are listening and then providing those capability. Now, the, another force at play I fear that I think is kind of relevant, and I, hopefully I'll be able to show you how toward the end, is the rise of the software as a service. And then this notion of software as a service is actually not very new. Like if you think about Salesforce, these guys are in business for more than a decade, I believe. But what's, what I think is interesting is the fact that these software as a service is more and more available for the tools that we use in the software development. So this is one of my favorite examples, is the source on demand, uh, which is the Selenium as a service thing. So they speak the same API that the Selenium remoting protocol uses, but they have all these virtual machines somewhere that's capable of running instantly, and then they charge like a, a cent per minute or something like that. So earlier I, I talked about this, um, the, uh, the unit of exchange between the, the degree of concurrency versus time, and we're talking about hours, but here it's minutes. So if you could land, let's say, the 10,000 tests at the same time, and then every one of those complete in one, one minute, then you, your 10,000 test case is complete in one minute, and you still pay the same amount of price compared to your running everything sequentially. Or the another service is the known, is called, this one is called Device Anywhere, um, and then what they do is they let you use the mobile devices, the real mobile devices, and then you can rent them by hour or something like that. And because there's the incredible diversity, especially in the Android side of the world, um, being able to actually use the physical machines for tests and then only pay for the actual amount of minutes that you use, it's quite convenient. So these are only possible, I mean, these things are certainly the game changer in terms of the higher in aiming for the, the more and more concurrencies. And if I, um, if, you, if you don't mind my shameless plug, um, the, my company CloudBees also offers DevOps Cloud, which is a Jenkins as a service. And it not only automates the maintenance of the Jenkins server, but it also provides this elastic build slaves, which actually carries out the build. So in a moment, if you, let's say, suddenly realize that you need to run the 12 concurrent test executions, we could assign those 12, like 12, I mean, the 12 machines in a single master, and then you can carry out the build right away. And as soon as they are done, those excessive capabilities be gone, so that uh, you don't, and then you only pay for the actual amount of total minutes that you spend on the build. Um, so yeah, so the, the reason I think I, the, this is kind of very useful is one that this has, it's kind of, the way I think of it, it's like a library in the next step. Because it's, it's, so, it's sort of like a library that you do not have to operate by yourself. It's taken care of by the other people. And uh, it also enables a very clever implementation behind the same API. And as, as can be seen in the case of the Selenium, I mean, source on demand guides, the Selenium as a service. They even provide you, they, they give you the ability to record what the browser is doing in the video format that made available within a few minutes of the test execution. If you think about what kind of efforts it takes to set that up on all these different environments from Windows to OS X and so on, it's quite an effort. So all this innovation that's going on behind the scene is nicely encapsulated behind the same API. And so you can take advantage of those things. And then the, the third is the, po the point that I've been getting at a number of times, which is the utility pricing. And here we are talking about the, the unit of time that's like in the order of minutes. So there really is 
a very compelling economic reasons and then the benefits in being able to run this all kinds of thing, all kinds of test execution in parallel and then get the result back quite quickly. Oops. So I think those are the kind of the slow but big changes that's happening all around us. And because they are big changes for us soldiers on the trench, I mean, in the trench, we might not see them, but nonetheless, they are real. At least this, the incredible abundance of computing power and then because of the physical constraints and the economic realities that's driving us toward the higher degree of concurrency and also all these automation efforts or the, the efforts that eventually enable more automations that's happening in lots of different layers. So the people pushing virtualization is different from people pushing the clouds. They are actually quite competing. Or the people pushing automation in the software development is yet another people. But nonetheless, all these independent efforts are sort of enabling us to do more and more automations. And so there is, when, we, when we see the things that we, you know, that we see around us, there are a lot of pieces like that that's becoming more automatable and programmable. So, and it, but what we need to do is just sort of glue them together and stitch them together to do something useful for us. And then we could get the great benefit out of it without doing too much work. Because all these hard work after all is done by the other people. So we just need to sort of piggyback on their effort and then just deliver the last, last inch, so to speak. But at the same time, the gluing work, the integration work is, is kind of tedious or tricky. It's not hard, but it's just, it does take a lot of effort to do so. So when I think about this, I think we need, we need some sort of something that juggles all these different pieces, glue them together, and then make sure that the things run smoothly. And that in my mind, that's what the capable butler does, which is what I think of Jenkins as, right? I mean, he, but I'd imagine an able butler would be able to coordinate all these the servants in the house and to make sure that the guests are well served and so on and so forth. Um, and then this is exactly what I think the Jenkins is, is doing nowadays or is capable of. So the Jenkins, I hope, uh, well, for those of you who don't know, which is the, it is an open source continuous integration server and that's written in Java. I've been doing this for about seven years. Um, and then there are a couple of things that this tool is really uh, has emphasis on. The one of them is that it'd be very easy to install and easy to use, because the point of the tool is to make you more productive. So if it actually sucks in your more time, then that's like a pointless. And, and I know, I mean, the, I deal with all these crappy tools in it, day in, day out, so I know what, how frustrating it can get. So we spend a lot of effort making sure that you could get up and running quickly, and also you could sort of grow, I mean, grow your usage of the Jenkins as you go. The other more important things, perhaps this is the defining characteristic of Jenkins, is that it is extensible. So we sort of allow people to implement interesting things on top of it, because there is incredible diversity in the development tools that we use, ranging from version control system to test framework. Um, a single tool cannot support them all unless we have a good extensibility story. So that's what the Jenkins got. And then as a testament, I mean, the, as a result of that, today we have more than 600 plugins developed by people all around the world, some on their spare time, some on their days of time, and then shared to the community that's ready to be installed just with a few mouse clicks from the Jenkins UI. So these things made Jenkins the most adapted continuous integration server in many surveys. And uh, we currently track the 47,000 installations around the world. And mind you, each of them is a server application that, use a lot of, I mean, that has a lot of users. And this is also a conservative estimate because we only know the number of instances from the instances that allowed us to sort of see them. And then I, know, I also know for the fact that the many companies don't enable this kind of ping home feature. So um, the, the thing that works very well with this extensibility is this idea that the Jenkins supports the distributed automations. Um, so we made a lot of improvements in the features in this space over time that allows Jenkins to control you know, anywhere from like one to say a few hundred computers. Um, and then you could manage them all from a single place that is Jenkins master. And because again, we emphasized on the ease of installation and the ease of use, 
uh, we created this mode of integration that allows you to deploy new slaves without manually doing anything. Like in the simplest case, you could specify the name of the machines and the SSH login name and your public key, I mean, sorry, your private key, and they'd be able to install Java, deploy the program, and all kinds of stuff for you. So as a case in point, um, the, after the previous conference the, that, that, that was Java 1 was over, I needed to unwind a little bit. So I, I did write this program that allows, uh, well, I'm sorry, I wrote this plugin that allowed Jenkins to list up all the iOS devices that's connected to all these slaves. And then I could deploy to any one of these devices from anywhere in the build cluster. Right, so this, this whole thing took only like 900 lines of code and, and it, you're basically done in one afternoon. And so if you think about what it takes to do this from scratch, that, that deals with that many computers at the same time, it's quite a lot, it's quite, quite a lot more than that. So in my mind, sort of this is turning into the platform of a sword. And when I see some of the larger users and what they are doing with Jenkins, this sort of clearly heading into these directions. So what are these things that these companies are doing that, that sort of take advantage of all this abundance of computing power that's, our, that's at our disposal? And so I wanted to talk about a few of the, uh, the techniques that the people are actually doing. And one of them is the, uh, the validated merge of commits or the two borrow the Oracle marketing team's wording that would be unbreakable bills. So the idea here is that if you think about, well, so, well, I'm sorry, so, so far I talked about how it is, how important it is to do more on the servers because your laptops are actually becoming relatively more important because there can be only one or two of them, but you have the plenty of the servers. So now if you think about whether the CI server has actually helped to push more workload from the your laptop to the servers, in many cases, it's actually not the case. And th this is because the, um, the CI servers gives additional visibility to the failed builds. So your manager would notice those problems a lot more often. So the word goes out, word goes out that um, um, the, the build must not break on the CI server, which kind of forces more people to execute more tests on their, on their client computers, which is quite painful. So the main, the, the underlying conflict here is that the, for you to sort of ship the set of the source code over to another machine, the commit is the sort of the best succinct way to describe that. If you think about the commit ID or revision number, it's describing a set of source tree in, in, relation, to, in relation to some other state of the source code in quite an efficient fashion. So this is how you want to be able to send the set of source code from one machine to another, but at the same time, in the traditional centralized version control system, the act of committing a changes, it expose your commit to the other people, and because if they are bad, the other people will be blocked by your program, and so this creates this tension that prevents people from making commit for the sake of testing. But in the distributed control, version control system, this is no longer an issue. So the emerging trend that the people are doing is to take advantage of this power that is the developer would create commits locally and instead of pushing the changes to the real team repository, you push the change to Jenkins. And then this is where the test gets executed. And then only after the changes are verified through your test or find bugs or whatever you, you specify, and then the Jenkins would more the result and push them into the eventual upstream server. So this essentially allows developer to never <laughs> run any test on their local computers. And so in this way, you can, freely, you, know, you can freely create more commits without worrying about potentially blocking your colleague's work. And you could also execute tests on the servers. And this is where it's a lot easier to execute things in concurrently, or if you have some tests that require your elaborate setup, like specific environments or the servers, middlewares, initialized to a certain state. I mean, these things are no longer a problem. What's traditionally been tricky to replicate on developer's laptop now no longer needs to be done. And also, the, the, the thing that I really like about this is that the tests can now run asynchronously. So as far as the developer is concerned, as soon as they are done with committing and pushed to the Jenkins, he's done, and he can move on to work on something else. And then the Jenkins would crunch the numbers afterward, and then provided that that works, everything else, the integration happens from then on without developer doing anything. So that sort of makes people more productive because people are not good at <coughs> doing context switching, right? coming back and forth between different works and waiting for the results. 
Um, and then, so this is popular enough practice that in, uh, in, the, in, a big, in a big team, like let's say Java AC team or NetBeans team, even though they don't use, they don't use Jenkins for this, um, they, you, can, you can see this kind of thing action in more elaborate form. So these are the projects that have a pretty large code base with somewhat monolithic environments, certainly in the case of Java C. So the way they work is instead of trying to sort of modularize everything, which is actually also what they are trying to do, but anyway, um, they sort of group a number of people for, uh, as a team which works on the similar set of technologies, and then they do this at, within their team level. And then once there is enough number of teams, they sort of aggregate that between different Jenkins-like things so that um, the, this allows, and then this allows the changes to flow between teams in a controlled but still efficient fashion. Now, another thing that, another approach is that people are doing that takes advantage of all these additional computing power is the more automated deployments. So, um, the, as I said, a lot of things that we deal with are independently becoming automatable. So the developers, for us, the building the code on the, on the CI server is sort of like an easy, easy thing now. And then similarly, for the operation people, the delivering the, the real final piece of work into all these servers is, is now automatable. And the same is true for the QA people. Um, they could execute tests on the servers in automated fashions. But so what's happening, it seems to me, is that all these individual disciplines within our profession that's managed to automate substantial amount of work that they do, but now the interaction between these different roles are prime target for the automation. So in a way, there's all these islands of small automation that's cropping up that cover specific software development discipline, but now we could sort of build the bridges across these things across the disciplines, and that creates a lot of very interesting automation possibilities. And so when I hear people speak words like continuous delivery, I think this is clearly what, what they are meaning, at least in my, in my lexicon. So we got a lot of things going on in this space in Jenkins as well. Um, so the one is this, the visualization, right? It's kind of important when you have lots of people from different teams working together to be able to see how things are flowing between them. So in this graphs like this, people could track what changes that's made are in what stages. So let's say uh, the change number 10, actually um, whatever changes that was in it, well, it's now it successfully completed the build and then now it's in the QA's hand and being under the testing. And if that works out, you'll see that it gets handed over to the deployment team for the deployment. Um, another way people have been taking advantage of this is that if you have this kind of continuous build execution going on, it's almost like you're having your binaries version control. There's all these slightly different binaries that each contain slightly different set of changes that's readily available. Right? So to, for the same reason tagging the version control system is useful, being able to tag a specific build based on their, I mean, the, based on their property or characteristics is useful. So the Jenkins out of the box had certain capability like being able to remember what was the latest stable build, meaning the one that passed all the tests. But it gets more interesting if you could actually define more semantically meaningful tags on these. So let's say there might be, um, if you have a, if we work in this environment that has the testing team and the development team distinctions, there's often this act of handoff of the binary from the development team to the test guys, right? And then, so if you could actually capture that as a tag in this tier that says, well, this is the build 12 that gets handed off, signed off to the QA team, that's useful. And uh, it gets even more useful if you could actually assign the, well, if you could assign these tags automatically. So let's say, in a normally in this environment of um, the developer handing off the binary to the QA team, the QA team doesn't really so much care about how exactly the developer have decided that this build is QA ready, but the development team normally had some implicit practice, right? But if you could actually make it explicit, let's say, if you could define a process that says, well, if the build successfully passed a set of unit tests, let's say that's called dev test, and also it has the find bugs execution that doesn't have any new warnings, and then, you, maybe you, you can actually tell that to Jenkins, and then Jenkins will be able to see that, oh, these things have actually successfully executed, so it's time to move the tag, the signed off the QA tag into this build. So this 
is the kind of building block that allows you to create a lot more interesting automation that spans across multiple disciplines. And in some extreme cases, the, the, I guess the, the big companies have such a complicated rules about how the changes would flow into the production system, they actually came up with a way to embed the whole BPMN workflow into Jenkins. So you could actually define this, uh, there, it comes with a GUI that lets you drag and drop and edit this nice graphical looking workflow, and the Jenkins should be able to execute those, and then this could involve like some of the tasks could be, uh, could be human tasks that, that says someone manually inspecting something and giving it, uh, I mean, giving it a thumbs up or something like that. So this is the kind of thing that the people are actually sort of doing in the Jenkins community today that enables the a lot more degree of automation. Um, and then, well, I'm sorry, and then if, the, if the doing this kind of graphical programming is not your taste, uh, we could also, we also have this means doing, we also have this means of doing similar things by using Groovy DSL. And so they, because this is a DSL, it comes with a lot of the primitives that talks and speaks the Jenkins language, like running a build of a particular job, executing a particular job with a single function call. And then along with all these things like parallel executions and try cats and so on, and it will keep track of everything that it's doing and give you a nice visualizations. So these things are allowing people to push more and more work to the servers. So I uh, guess in, in conclusion, um, one of the things that I wanted to get across is that the computers are getting more and more abundant and then more and more cheaper, and meaning we need to be able to sort of embrace them and take advantage of those. I think we, we as a profession is used to putting a lot of other people out of work, right? We are automating what all these, the, I mean, the, the paper pushing work, and then those people who used to do those things are now out of work. But now the same thing is kind of happening to ourselves, right? So it's because we are trying to automate things that we do, um, and then we are sort of, and the software development field is suddenly not immune from this general direction in which more and more things are done by computers. And the reason I think this is a real, real trend, not, not one of those, the quote unquote next generation thing, is because all these things are driven by many different people that's often competing, like the, um, the let's say the Amazon and VMware, or the, all these SaaS company, or the people the open source hackers that's creating distributed version control system. So again, all we need to do is just piggyback on all this hard effort that the people are doing, and then just glue things together, and then get, get sort of nice value out of it. And then this is where I think the Jenkins key role is, and it has been, but it's sort of more and more becoming important. So that's sort of how I wanted to end this talk, that um, if you, Therefore, if you haven't had a chance to play with Jenkins, I mean, the, the better late than never, so this is your time to do so. Um, and otherwise, if you're already using Jenkins, think about what kind of things you can do that more takes advantage of what you've already done and then take it to the next stage. So with that, I guess I wanted to, to, uh, to, to end it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kawaguchi. So we will move to the uh, question and answer session. So anybody, please raise your hand if you have any questions. It's OK? You sure? Please. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, we actually use Jenkins uh, in our yes. company. Awesome. Uh, and uh, I think Hannah will actually uh, go over some of that in his talk. But you mentioned um, um, CVS uh -huh. as uh, something perhaps uh, some developers or a project should not necessarily be using because it doesn't produce the machine readable uh -huh. output. Um, there are some really successful open source projects that still use CVS, yes, like uh, OpenBSD, uh -huh. which produces OpenSSH, right. And um, so I'm just curious, um, how could uh, a project like that, that has been very, very successful in terms of producing uh, releases, on um, for the past 18 years, on a you know a, every six months, and and uh, producing a product uh, that has, I, I think, a security reputation that is. 
uh, beyond reproach. Uh, you know, only two right. root exploits in the past 18 years, and one is OpenSSH related, one is IPv6 related. Right. How could we use uh, Jenkins to, uh, uh, how would it benefit a, a project like that, that is so, so successful? Yeah, so when I said the CVS belonged to the previous century, I guess I was, was part joking, and I do understand that the practical reasons people are, are still stuck with, you know, the less than ideal, let's just say, the tool environment. Um, and it is true that well, I mean, many of these projects are quite successful, but that, that the point that I'd make is that if, they, if the tool environment is more modern, I'd, I'd, I'd venture that they'd be even more successful. And in the context of these open source projects, um, the, the, in, in terms of what they can do to take advantage of these the things like CI servers, the, one of the main key challenges in, in all these native tools is the fact that the changes that the people are making are not necessarily portable. And so if there's a service that allows the, uh, the project the, to verify the inbound patches with multiple, the plethora of environment that they have to support, and then get the feedback instantly, that's very useful. And if you look at the, um, the OpenSUSE uh, build services or the OpenJDK effort, they are actually doing this kind of thing. So I, I think there's a lot of things that they could do in this space. But uh, I, I do have a lot of respect for the people doing CVS. I mean, I've been using it for the longest time myself, and so is the open SSN. So, uh, yeah, I guess uh, hopefully that, uh, that, that, that answers. Okay, thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you very much. Another question, other questions? Please raise your hand. It's okay? Okay, well, we will end this session. Thank you very much, thank Mr. Very Kawaguchi. Much. Thank, thank you so conference. much. So we will have a break time. Uh, from 1 o'clock, we will start the keynote address by Mr. Hiroshi Mikitani of Rakuten, Inc. I hope all of you enjoyable time here, uh, Rakuten Technology Conference 2012. Thank you. <laughs>